Good morning, I'm Andrew Banks, current chairman of the Miserasi Working Group and day job is for Fraser Nash Research where I'm in charge of the embedded software fitted to our hybrid electric driveline. The aim of this talk, as per the title, to give a quick overview of the work done on the committee over the past uh, couple of years and what we're doing moving forward. First of all, we'll go through a very, very quick history of Misra. I will do a couple of myths that uh, keep coming round and around. Quick talk about safety and security, then on to what we've done and what we're doing. So, quick history. Misra came around directly as a result of the problems there are with the C language, in that there's undefined, unspecified, all sorts of weird behaviours. I mean, there are some that says you shouldn't be using C at all in safety critical things. In fact, the Department of Defence in America for many years, that was their view, you were not allowed to use C in safety critical applications. In fact, it was until roughly MISRA came along and was picked up and, uh, and run. And most recently, the um, Lockheed Martin Joint Strike Fighter is basically built on the MISRA coding guidelines which leads us to the first myth. A lot of people, despite how it's been adopted, still hold the view that MISRA is only an automotive coding standard. You know, we came out of the automotive industry, and that's something that we're very, very proud of. We do not want to throw away that heritage. But we are equally applicable for all standards. Say, Joint Strike Fighter, NASA, I think we all recognise those as automotive companies. And their coding standards are very much built on top of MISRA. Second one we hear a lot is that MISRA is just a safety coding guideline, not for security. And in some ways we're hostage to our own fortune because in our guidance we actually talk about being safety related software. Although the front page actually describes ourselves as being um, guidelines for using critical systems and the vision talks about any high reliability. So Please, no questions at the end of what's the MISRA equivalent for medical systems or for any other industry, because the answer is MISRA is actually just what you want. Safety and security, actually at the software level, are very much, sort of, it's an esoteric difference, and many other languages don't actually have different words. And I was at a conference recently where one of the speakers kept telling me that, or kept telling the audience, a certain problem wasn't his problem because that was a safety issue. Now, sorry, in my book, at the software level, we have to think about the whole integrity nature of the software. So in MISRA, we talk about the standards for safety critical, but any application, it's the same sort of thing. And I say, don't take my word for it. ISO 17691 is a document, and I mentioned earlier about the problems with C language. Uh, the ISO C panel, in their guidance, say, we do not consider the standard to be broken. Yet they publish an uh, additional document to fix the security vulnerabilities in the C language. But, uh, say, ISO talk about, in software level, the need for the same requirements. We talk about security, we talk about safety, and not directly in a link to the, the title of this conference. Actually, I think we need to start talking about high integrity that covers all of the requirements of safety, all of the requirements for security, and all the other requirements of making sure that our product works at all times. What have we been doing the last couple of years? For those that use MISRA will remember that MISRA C2012 came out, didn't quite make 2012, but early 2013. So following on from that, we spent a lot of time producing a document called MISRA Compliance. The aim of this document is not just to fit with C, but also the MISRA C++ guidelines. Again, some of you may use those. What had happened over time was that the C guidelines for the, the common aspects and the C++ had sort of diverged a bit. So the idea here is that we bring it back to one set of clear guidelines that can be used across all languages. And we keep getting people saying, what about MISRA C Sharp and MISRA Java? Well, if there's any volunteers in the room that want to help produce one of those, this will help as part of that too. So what does it cover? It's a common refrain from companies to say, our software is MISRA compliant. And then you go, what do you mean? 
oh, we've got hundreds of deviations, but don't worry about those. <clears throat> so the idea here is that we've produced some clearer guidance as to what constitutes MISRA compliance, details some additional guidelines of how to tailor the guidelines. Um, a common issue with the, the last update was people saying, well, all these rules that are required should be mandatory. We want them to be mandatory. Well, we now give you a mechanism of how to do that. Another area, especially in the automotive world, with autos are becoming more and more prevalent, was how to deal with adopted code. And that's code that you haven't written that somebody else has. You know, it may not be written to your house coding guidelines. So maybe that little... Uh, issue of how to do the difference. A um, bit more on the deviation process, trying to define, I mean, ever since day one, there's been guidance of how to deviate the rules, but it's still common to hear QA departments say, I want 100% MISRA compliance with no deviations. Oh, and the last bit is to produce, and this is one of the particular aspects from JAMA, is what we call pre-approved permits, which are uh, documents that can be included almost at the contractual level to say, these areas you may deviate, others you may not. What is compliance? Firstly, it's not for the organisation. It's done on a project-by-project project basis, possibly even a deliverable version, because obviously the goalposts move. And it doesn't mean no deviations. It is better to do a proper documented deviation than to write clever code just so that the misery checker doesn't tell you something's wrong. And compliance, as it says on the bottom, is achieved when basically you followed the guidelines and the violations are documented. Those of you who use MISRA will know, 2012, we introduced the third level of mandatory that you cannot deviate. Required, you can deviate, but you have to document it. Advisory are recommendations. One of the interpretations that is quite common for the advisories is actually you can disapply them. MISRA C2012 actually says you can't, but you can document that you don't want to enforce them. Slightly different, but many people just disapplied them on a whim. What we're providing here is, is a mechanism of allowing you to tailor those so you can raise some rules, and in the case of the advisories, you can disapply them. But we need this written down. It shouldn't actually be that much of an overhead because in order to have reached the decision that you don't want to do something, you've got to have done the thought process. Adopted code can be a Pandora's box because you get code and before this uh, document came into place, actually there was no way of not applying the same set of guidelines to that adopted code as to the rest of your project. There are special cases when you can't change the code and sometimes we need to be able to accommodate those. A couple of examples there. Um, and I say, in the automotive world, autos are, is becoming more and more of an issue. Deviations. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes one of our rules may have a genuine case where you don't want to comply with it. Hopefully few and far between. There are some legitimate cases, and a common one is to do with the hardware access uh, where you have to dereference pointers. Some of you will know what that means, some of you don't care. <clears throat> but for those of you that it's a problem, it's actually a, a real reason why you need, in a specific set of, of code, to be able to deviate. But your deviation shouldn't merely be a case of saying, I've done this, this is a problem. We need to make sure both you and the reviewer understands why you have to break the rule. The summary. We've created three separate documents, but actually they're probably extra columns in a single ex uh, spreadsheet and deviation records. So the overhead of being misery compliant should not be onerous. The key part is make sure you do the required tasks as you are going through it. Don't wait to the end and just try and catch up and document what you've done. I said earlier that MISRA is a security standard as well as, or guidelines I should say, as, opposed, as well as safety. A couple of years ago at a conference in Germany, a speaker presented and said, yep, MISRA is an excellent safety guideline, but it's not a security guideline. And here's some evidence. 
And so we looked at what they presented. And the way they were working was um, based on an American standard called CERT-C, which I'll come to in a second. Now, CERT was originally presented to ISO to be their C-Secure standard, the ISO 17961 that I talked to earlier. So we looked at the ISO standard and we assessed it and we found actually there were a couple of places that we didn't meet the rules that ISO had come up with. So we said, okay, fair enough, we'll add some more rules. So we did. The matrix of our analysis and the result of the amendment can be downloaded for free. Hopefully those of you that are using MISRA have already done so. And the summary of this is to address the, I think it's, there's a matrix in a minute, six, I think it was, uh, ISO rules that we didn't comply with, we've created 13. That's because ours are very, very targeted on the specific problems, whereas the, the ISO ones were fairly, am I allowed to say woolly? This is the analysis we did. So there's 46 of their rules. We'd already covered explicitly 22, um, and in one way or another covered all bar six, two of which we'd partly covered. So after the amendment, we've covered all 46. But I mentioned CERT, very big in America, funded by the DOD, which gives them a big advantage over us in Misra, who do it for fun. They have a lot of people, less now, because their funding's been cut. Um, we actually at MISRA view CERT as actually being complementary, and I'll show you why in a second, because there's quite a lot of overlap. And we've tried to establish communications with CERT, and in an ideal world, we'd be able to work together. The CERT is done through a website and does change fairly quickly. Um, they have issued a hardback book and recently published a PDF. We actually, as I say, already cover most of the, the rules. A few at the top are because CERT have already pushed out their C11 version. So well done to them for being quicker than us. I suppose the confession is, out of the 98 or 99 rules, we don't comply with two of them. And both those are to do with the use of the RAND function, which I'm not sure many of us in the safety critical world actually use. Into really interesting stuff, there's a TC. And uh, this is where Opportunities like this are good because it's only with the feedback from the user base that we can actually make our standard better. And most of the items in the TC are from users identifying or querying the wording we've got in our document. I had hoped to be able to say that is available today. Unfortunately, it will be a, a little bit longer just for internal processes. Where are we and where are we going? The next stop really is that imminently and it will probably be early in the new year, we're going to do a roll-up of everything we've done so far, which is the security rules, the TC, and it will be a, a MISRA C. I call it 21X. Some people keep mentioning 2016. It's more likely to be 2017. And the key point I'd like to emphasise here is that the, the roll-up will be the documents added together. For those that have been using MISRA for a long time will know the from MISRA uh, to... 1998 to 2004 was a complete rewrite. From 2004 to 2012 was a complete rewrite. The tool vendors don't like that and uh, users don't like it. So the strategy for us is that we will be doing this as updates and increments and roll-ups. So the, the new version will be pretty much the same as the old one plus the, the deltas. Moving forward, <coughs> C11 is the, the next big issue on the horizon, and uh, the ISO C working group actually did things in a nice and helpful way for us, in that it's actually quite structured in a series of appendices, which we can then address one by one. We're looking at CERT. Um, we're also looking to improve our coverage of the standard library. At the moment, we cover all of the aspects of what's called the freestanding code, which is if you build an implementation for an embedded system. For the hosted, where you've got an operating system, we, we are quite restrictive in some of our rules that says don't use any of this. And we're looking at adding coverage to mean that you can use some of the quite essential functions in your system. 
Uh, and so we welcome feedback from all the users. And if anybody wants to join us, they're quite welcome to do so. So C11 is the bit moving ahead. Uh, and again, following on from how we did the security guidelines of adding little bolt-ons, that's how we propose to deal with C11. And uh, that will increment over the next few years. So in summary, hopefully you'll all agree BISRA C is a well-respected safety guideline. It's equally applicable as a security guideline. It's evolved from being automotive into pan-industry. It will continue to evolve. I welcome the opportunity to stand up at these sort of conferences. I want to hear the user base talk back to me and uh, anybody who wants to join us, absolutely welcome to do so. Thank you.